It's the Choke MMA Show. And now your host, Eric Fontenez. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Choke MMA Show. I am your host, Eric Fontenez. With me on the television set is my man ESK from the Canadian Southwest. Spencer Kite, how you doing, man? Doing well, dude. Uh, for the like third time, I think. I think That's this, right. People, people don't know this, and, and I'm not like outing Eric here in a like throwing him under the bus way or anything well, like hell that you're not. But, okay i i am we had taped what i had i was set to send out a tweet saying we just taped the best episode of the choke mma show it was brilliant to date it was gr- flawless no technical issues so we thought yeah I, I got a message from it i got a message from eric that said hey dude um we may have to do this again. <laughs> yeah, we have to do it again. But you know what? This show is going to be even better than the last one. You have my guarantee. It is. Yes. I promise. Absolutely. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because we're going to talk about Anderson Silva. Isn't that awesome? We're going to talk a lot about Anderson Silva. Yeah, he of course. He features prominently in this show. He does feature prominently. Reason why is because UFC 162 is this weekend. He's going to fight Chris Weidman in a uh, middleweight title fight, the main event for UFC 162, of course. But he's made headlines in, in other aspects of MMA. He was recently uh, in, a, in a media luncheon uh, where he told reporters that if he were to have a super fight with John Jones... He feels he would lose. That's right. Anderson Silva, winner of 16 consecutive fights in the <laughs> UFC by utter annihilation most of the time, thinks he would lose to John Jones. A lot of people might say, you know what? This, this guy's lacking confidence. This guy doesn't have what it takes anymore. ESK and I, however, <laughs> disagree. And we yes. think it's all just a bunch of nonsense. Silva's playing with the media, as Dana White likes to say. And uh, I don't believe it for one minute. ESK, you agree with me on this, right? I do, absolutely. We actually had a follower send us a message on Twitter saying Anderson Silva lacks confidence. Yes. Oh, <laughs> which you is, gullible which soul. Which is one of the most absurd statements in the history of uh, absurd statements. Yeah. Forget um, MMA. Forget history of MMA. Yeah, We're talking about a history general, of like absurd all, statements. All time absurd. It's As just you nonsense. Said, 16 wins in a row, most of them by complete domination. Uh, confidence is not a problem. This is very much Anderson Silva tweaking the media, setting up a headline, and sort of not having to be the guy that sits there and and shines his belt himself in front mm-hmm. of everybody. He just kind of says, you know, I, I don't think I could beat John Jones. And then we all run to our computers with a headline, Anderson Silva, colon, can't beat John Jones. Mm -hmm. And then talk about how great Anderson Silva is and why he would potentially be able to beat John Jones. And and the discussion and breakdown of, you know, whether he can or can't beat John Jones, we'll get to down the road. But but I mean, it's one of those things that (laughs) this is what this is what makes reporters happy. Whether or not he's telling yeah. the truth, it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter at all. The fact of the matter is, he said, you know, I don't think I can beat John Jones. He, no. That makes us say, hey, there's a quote. And we run to our computers, as ESK said, and we write our stories. Here's my evidence. GracieMag.com's traffic today spiked because we have that story up on the website. And I'm sure... Uh, Spence, you wrote something that uh, probably drew in some heavy numbers, did you not? I didn't write anything today off of it. I wrote something that'll come up uh, in a couple of days and just and talked about this exact thing. Like this to me is is most things Anderson says. I feel that there's that little like smirk and a wink at the end of it where he's just sort of yeah, like clearly playing with you, like teasing you and waiting for you to. It's like opening the door just far enough that you can see what's inside, but not really. And you have to decide if you want to walk through. He's not necessarily going to invite you, but he's not going to turn you away either. It's just like, listen, if you want to write that I can beat John Jones, have at it. If you want to say I'm lacking confidence and clearly I think my skills are deteriorating and the end is near, go ahead. Right. I'm just going to say right now, I don't think I can beat John Jones. Smirk, wink. What you do with it is walk up to off you. home run. 
<laughs> yeah, he he doesn't need to be. He's at a point in his career that he doesn't need to be the guy selling his fights hugely. Um, and and in that same luncheon, he talked about this fight this weekend with Chris Weidman, and sort of in in breaking down, he was asked what challenges Weidman presents, and instead of saying what all of us have thought about bigger, stronger, faster version of Chael Sonnen, undefeated, looks like a great prospect. Anderson kind of just went, well, he's the next guy in line. He worked his way up here. It's his turn for a shot, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. And that's, just, that's who he is. It's the way it works. It makes for it makes for a fun interview, it makes for great headlines, really good traffic numbers. Makes for good fodder on the Choke MMA yeah. show. That's for damn exactly. sure. Exactly. Just out of curiosity, who would you pick in a fight between Anderson <laughs> Silva and John Jones? Seeing as that you're the expert. Yeah. Uh, it's oh, hard maybe not the expert because he yeah, doesn't have an answer right off the top of the head. Damn it. It's hard for me to ever think about picking against Anderson Silva because we've seen so many brilliant performances. I still remember my reaction of sitting and watching UFC 126 and watching his display against Stefan Barr at UFC 153 yeah. where he just kind of leaned against the fence and was like, whatever. Whatever. Hit me on take, the chin, take, whatever. Take take your best shot. Mm-hmm. Here you missed. I'm going to let you try again. Oh, you missed again. Here's a knee in the sternum. We're done here. Oh, that's cute. You try to fight. That's that nice. being said, I I would favor John Jones simply because, and, and Anderson alluded to this when, and spoke to this in that at that media lunch. That's right. He sees a lot of John Jones. He sees a lot of himself in John Jones. Well, he sees a lot of the spider in John Jones. Yeah, he referred to himself in the third person. That's right. Third person nickname. Spencer, since the topic of Anderson Silva and John Jones (laughs) is taking up the majority of this first segment, tell me, who are you picking in a super fight between the two? It's extremely hard for me to pick against Anderson Silva. Is it now? Yeah, because, I mean, we've all seen... We've all seen the performances. We've seen the front kick to, to Vitor Belfort. We've seen the Stefan Bonner fight and everything in between. Forrest and Griffin, decimation. Yeah, just everything. But John Jones is the one dude I will pick ahead of Anderson Silva. Just because of all the things Anderson actually said at that media lunch on Monday. Um, younger, stronger, faster. Um, and just, I mean, he... he said it in the third person nickname referential of <laughs> I see a lot of spy the spider sees a lot of himself in or something along those lines. I just think the way we've seen John Jones decimate top five, top ten talent at light heavyweight, he's still getting better. He's still improving. Um I would pick him against a bunch of heavyweights right now if he just yes. was like, I'm gonna go have a fight at heavyweight because there's nothing for me at light heavyweight right now. And as much as I admire, respect, think Anderson Silva is the greatest fighter in the history of fighters, right. I would pick John Jones. I slightly lean towards John Jones, too. Although, I think it would be a competitive fight. Lots of fun for MMA fans oh, would, to have at I it. I would love it. Oh, yeah. I would totally <laughs> just – I'd buy a ticket. I haven't bought a ticket in years. That's only because I'm press and you know we go to these things under different circumstances. But regardless – Fun fight. Also making headlines today was Vitor Belfort. He says he's uninterested <laughs> in a fight with Gegard Mousasi and points to Twitter campaigns and social media uh, campaigns as, as something that not not so good. He doesn't like yeah. it when people go and tweet, hey, I want to fight this guy. I want to fight that guy. But Belfort goes ahead and goes on Twitter you know, thereafter, and says, I should fight the right. winner next, Dana White. Yeah. Yes, Kay, please explain this to me because I clearly don't get it. <laughs> um, it it very much is a pot calling the kettle black situation of, yes. hey, Gegard Musasi, you can't come on Twitter and say you want to fight me and we should, I should be your next opponent. You haven't done enough to warrant that fight. Now, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I need to go remind Dana White right here in 140 characters or less that I will be paying close attention to Saturday's fight and I should be the next guy to fight them 
hey, everybody, please retweet this. Hey, you know what's funny about that tweet is I think he actually used all 140 characters. He, he, he totally juiced that thing yeah. to the max. It, it was a big block text of, yes, Dana, me and my fans or me and the fans will be paying close attention. I should have next. Which, I mean, is, is a valid, maybe a valid argument. I mean, Vitor has looked great. We talked about him last week as being the best fighter of the first half, his two yes. knockout wins. He has looked great at middleweight outside of the Anderson Silva fight, even had his moment in the first round of the John Jones fight. Right. So you could make, he, he does make a compelling argument. The irony, of course, is is that his argument and, and his lobbying is done on the platform that he thinks people shouldn't use to lobby and get fights. Well, but, here's here's the thing. Yeah, that that's kind of silly of Vitor <laughs> to say, no, don't do that. And by the way, I'm going to do that there. Yes. But does Gegard Mousasi, in your in your point of view, deserve a fight at v- with Vitor Belfort at this point, coming off a win against a guy that everybody expected him to beat at UFC on Field TV Nine and in Eler Latifi? Does he really deserve a shot at Vitor Belfort at this point in his uh, UFC career? I've gotten in the habit of taking the word "deserve" out of my out of my vocabulary when talking about MMA and what do you and say? Matchmaking. Well, hold on. What what do you say when you want to raise? What do you, what do you say when when, I've when you want to break? Use the word earn. earn. Oh, okay. You I've know what I would do time. if I were you? I would go tweet your boss right now and campaign for whatever you need in order to earn it, because clearly you don't deserve it. Because here's the ah. thing. Gegard Mousasi probably doesn't deserve a fight with Vitor Belfort. Yeah, there's my my weekly air quotes for everybody. Uh, he probably doesn't deserve a fight with Vitor Belfort, considering his last fight was at 205 against Ilir Latifi, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's had injury issues, was out for almost a year, had the Mike Kyle fight. Now he's out again with another knee injury. But he's a top 10 wherever he fights. He wants to move back down to middleweight. I agree. He'd probably, he'd probably be a top 10 guy if he stayed at light heavyweight as well. Um, depending on how things shake out Saturday, what happens with this championship fight, who else moves to the front of the line and things like that. There's some other middleweight fights on the uh, on the card. Vitor could probably make a compelling fight, as we said, f- a compelling argument to be next in line. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't have a problem with them saying, let's do this fight. Vitor and Gegard Mousasi because part of it is the, the need to build Gegard Mousasi as right. a recognizable name, as a fighter who has that potential he was supposed to fight Alex Gustafson that was supposed to be a little bit his his debut and his sort of launch party um, it was on Fuel TV which sort of hampers that a little bit kind but of. hey, Fuel TV out Drew Bellator a couple, and they did. A couple of weeks ago, I'm not saying not for nothing, no. but I'm just saying, fight master. <laughs> um, I'm so I mean, it, oh, shit, it makes ratings. sense because Vitor is a guy who consistently draws eyeballs. He is a very recognizable name to casual fans. He will sell out whatever venue you put him in in Brazil, and I fully expect his next fight to be in Brazil because why <laughs> wouldn't you keep going back to that market with yes. him when they consistently do wild, wild numbers? especially on TV as well that we don't often talk about. And so it makes sense. Yes. Is it deserved? Is it is it necessarily what should happen? No, but when does that ever when does that ever Yeah, the uh, the logic in, in matchmaking hasn't necessarily reflected right. people who have earned it or deserve it right. or right. whatever. I think the fight happens if Weidman upsets Silva this weekend because if Weidman beats Silva Dana White's already said that Silva gets an immediate rematch. And that's speaking of, here's that word again, probably deserved because yeah. Silva has 16 consecutive wins in the UFC, has been the front man for the organization for going on seven years now. So it's a yeah. no-brainer. But regardless, Vitor Belfort, Gegard Mousasi, it's not happening in Vitor's eyes. He's pretty much just going to get the winner of Saturday's right. fight. You know what, ESK? I think at this point we should bring up our guest segment. Do you know who we have on this week? I do. You uh, you dropped a little tease for us on Instagram last week. I did. You swung over to Black House. 
and, and the picture was of UFC middleweight Hodger Gracie in a big like trash bin full of ice water yes. freezing after a workout. Yes. It wasn't a trash bin though. It was a big Tupperware thing. And he was inside of it. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, Loyota Machida was in it after him. I'm not sure if Roger left anything in there for him as, uh, as uh, Machida was just sitting in the tub. But, yeah, they, he, he, he was nice enough to grant us an interview. So we got some behind-the-scenes uh, stuff with Roger Gracie. So we're going to bring that to you now. Check it out. Roger Gracie, multiple-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion is set to make his Octagon debut this Saturday at UFC 162. Having his last name comes with heavy expectations, Roger says, but that doesn't contain the jiu-jitsu champ turned MMA middleweight's excitement about getting his first shot in the world's leading MMA promotion. I think in one way it makes me very happy, you know. The, my family yeah, created the UFC, you know, I have a, I think I'm the fourth or the fourth or fifth Gracie to fight in the in there and you know we made history well, especially in the beginning and I think it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling to, to carry on the, the legacy that my family created you know. In terms of dealing with the pressure of carrying on the family legacy Roger says it's no sweat. The fighter explains that he's been dealing with that kind of thing his whole life and Saturday's pay-per-view will be no different. And I think pressure he always existed being a Gracie, you know, I think I've been fighting for so long and I've been dealing with that pressure, you know, ever since I was born, the, the, the being a fighter, they has to to do well because I've got a, you got a Gracie name, everyone expects you to, to fight and to do great things, being a Gracie, so that kind of pressure, it's, it's, it's the same and different at the same time, you know, but the pressure of being a Gracie is, is, is always there. And I think I've been dealing with that pretty well by now, you know. So it's, I don't think it, you, you put any more pressure on my shoulders now. I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty used to it. For his Octagon debut, Roger will be taking on fellow Strikeforce alumni Tim Kennedy. It's an opponent that Roger says is a complete fighter. In the stand-up and even in the comfort zone of the ground game, the Gracie isn't taking any part of this fight lightly. I think Tim Kennedy, he's a, you know, he's a, he's a great fighter. He's, he, he, he's coming from strike for Sue, but you know, he's, he's has a very high level and he's, he's very com, uh, complete. I think his stand-up is good, his groundwork is good, his wrestling, his conditioning. So I have to take this, this fight very carefully. I definitely cannot underestimate him. <laughs> the ones that you, you, you do underestimate is the one that you end up losing, you know. Five of six of Gracie's wins have come by way of submission. Obviously, MMA covers many more aspects than just grappling, but it's hard not to bet that Gracie will be looking to finish the fight with a choke or something similar. It's something the black belt says he'll be working hard for. I really believe myself and I train really hard for this fight and, and hopefully I will come out with a win. You know, fight is a fight. I cannot predict that I will win, but I truly believe that I, I have a, a very big chance. So let's wait and see. <laughs> Five or six of your wins have come by way of submission. Can we expect the same thing come next week? I'll be working hard to that goal. <laughs> and there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Roger Gracie, who fights Tim Kennedy at UFC 162. And speaking of UFC 162, I think it's time to preview the fight card. What do you think, ESK? Sounds good. I'm always up for some, some predictions. Yes, and we will go fight by fight on the main card, starting with the main card opener of Mark Munoz versus Tim Bosch. Who you got? I got Mark Munoz. A um, little worried about the time off, a little, little bit worried about the ring rust. But, uh, That's reasonable. Mark, Mark is really fired up for this fight. He, uh, he had some time off, battled through some depression, um, tweeted out some pictures earlier earlier in the week, earlier end of end of last week, uh, over the weekend. Sometime of, in the past. Sometime in sometime very recently. Before today. Yes. Um, detailing what he described as his journey from obese to a beast. Yes. Uh, was up at 
260 pounds after the loss to Weidman and a broken foot and all like that. He's crazy motivated. He hasn't been 100% in his UFC career. I think we see the best version of the Filipino wrecking machine to date on Saturday. I agree, and I am also picking Munoz in this fight. All love and respect to Tim Bosch, but Munoz just seems super laser-focused for this yeah. fight. As you said, he was at over 260 pounds, and those photos are remarkable. If you've yeah. had an opportunity to see them online, you can go to GracieMag.com, by the way, and see them. But go ahead and check them out. Uh, he was, uh, you know, a chubby Filipino guy, and he got down to a ripped 190-something pound man, uh, a Filipino wrecking machine, if you will. The name's appropriate. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Munoz in this one simply because he was able to come back from the depths, find that focus, and get back to what looks like a superior athlete. Moving on, Cub Swanson and Dennis Seaver, and I have a feeling... ESK that you and I are going to disagree on this one. Who you got? I have Cub Swanson in ah. a fight that I am I am very much looking forward to. Um, this is a fight that I think deserves more recognition than it's getting. Mm -hmm. uh, Cub feels the same way. He's talked about the, the co-main event being two dudes that are coming off losses, one of them being a guy that he's beaten. Obviously, that has a lot more to do with Frankie Edgar than it does with Charles Oliveira. Yes. But but Cub's been on a roll. He's a guy that, that to me, took a little while to find his groove, um, took a little while to find that confidence in himself that he can translate everything he does in the gym into the cage every single time out. It is repeatable for him. He's he's looked phenomenal his last four fights. Three straight knockouts, a decision win over Dustin Poirier. As good as Dennis Seaver has looked, and, and I was in Seattle for his last fight against Nam Pham, where he looked phenomenal. I just, in those big moments, in those fights where Dennis Seaver has had the chance to sort of take the next step, he's... He staggered in the past. The Donald Cerrone fight comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I think Cub is a very technical striker. I think he is absolutely on point right now. And I think he keeps his role going and, and gets another step closer to a title shot. You know what? I was right. We you disagree. disagree. <laughs> exactly. I just think that Seaver is far too technical for Swanson. Swanson, I feel, against uh, extremely technical guys, i.e. Jose Aldo, uh, is not he, he doesn't do very well I mean you you, you talk about Seaver and, and and him dealing with the big moments and not able to c overcome those I think Swanson is is the same with with technical technical guys and Seaver is exactly that he is a, an outstanding European kickboxer striking is you don't see it very often in MMA his spinning yeah. back kicks his spinning heel kicks are are laser sharp. He's really good on the feet. I just don't see Swanson dealing with that for the for the majority of three rounds. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Seaver in this one. You know, you made a comment off the air that we don't agree or we agree far too much. Yeah. This is one where we I'm have, going to enjoy disagreeing with you, man. Yeah, we have agreed on most picks, so it's nice to have one that we're opposite on that we're that we're rooting interests are different, and I look forward to being back here next week and discussing Cub Swanson's victory. Ah, man, he's rubbing it in. But I think we're going to agree on this one. Roger Gracie and Tim Kennedy. Who you got, my man? I I have Gracie. I think the move to middleweight was, was a very wise move. I agree. Um, as much as he's still a work in progress, as much as the striking aspect of his game and the stand-up aspect of his game is still rough and, and sort of being developed... He is a 10-time world champion in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think his size at 6'4 or 6'5, really big dude. Um, yeah, yeah. Really, really plays to his advantage on the ground as well, able to connect on some things that, that other guys may not. Um, and I like the matchup for him because Tim Kennedy is, is the right kind of confident to test himself against a guy in their best area. Mm -hmm. And I think Gracie does a good enough job of, of getting inside and finding those moments where he can first bring the fight to where he's most comfortable on the ground right. and then keeping you there, controlling the controlling the action, doing enough in terms of transitioning and, and moving to more dominant positions to not get stood up. And then once you make that little slip, 
Game over. It's all over, right? <laughs> yeah, it's I, a wrap. I'm picking. I'm picking Gracie too. Um, and you you hit the nail right on top of the head, man. He's able to find any hole that you might leave and take advantage of it to put the game or, or to put the fight within his game in his comfort zone. Yeah. I feel that uh, you know. I, I use the word overzealous. That might not be the right word, but I'm thinking that that Kennedy is going to be so aggressive that you know Gracie's going to catch him, put him on his back, and we're going to see another submission. I mean, Ken or or, or Gracie's all of get Gracie's wins, or most of them anyway. I think save, five yeah, of six. Save one. Yeah, save one. Yeah have been submissions. He's been able to t- to go at his opponents, been able to, like I said, bring him to where he wants and finish the fight on his level. So, And I also yeah. asked Gracie, I said, you know, five or six of your wins have come by submission. Are we going to see the same thing on Saturday? And he, and he tells me, he's like, I'm going to be very, I'm going to work very hard to get that outcome. Yeah, middleweight has been that one division that we've still seen guys be able to be specialists and have success, uh, especially on the ground. Damian Maya did it. Um, Antonio Braganeto looked really great in his debut against Anthony Smith. Another jiu-jitsu Hodger, world champion. Who, who Hodger Gracie beat last time out. Yeah. Um, and, and Hodger's done the same thing both at light heavyweight and, and in his first couple fights at, at middleweight. And I just think Tim Kennedy doesn't have one-punch knockout power. He's not going to put you away. He needs to outwork you. And I think the minute you get too close, those long arms come out, those hands connect, we go to the canvas, and then you're stuck there. That's all she wrote. So <laughs> the, the middleweight success is going to continue for Hodger, Roger, Gracie. Moving on to the co-main event, Frankie Edgar and Du Bronx. Charles Oliveira, who you got, man? I got Frankie Edgar. The losing streak comes to an end. Yes. Um, I think I, I still really like Charles Oliveira as a prospect. I think he's a guy that we've seen some good things from in his UFC career so far. He hasn't been able to take that next step against top competition, both previously at lightweight. I don't think he does it here against the former world champion of Frankie mm-hmm. Edgar. Um, this is a fight Frankie really does need to win as well. Absolutely. Um, not that that necessarily is going to play too much into things. I think stylistically it's a very good fight for him as much as we look at the three straight losses and and we think about you know the stumbles they've been against other world champions guys that we have in the top five top ten of the pound for mythical pound for pound lists mythical. he came right re- he came right re- because of the hypothetical pound yeah, for pound lists. No, they're not right. he came real <laughs> close to beating ben henderson in that second fight a lot of people still think he did myself included and so as much as there's those three straight losses, they're against elite competition. Charles Oliveira isn't elite at this point in his career. Uh, I think Frankie just, he puts on a typical Frankie Edgar display and, and sort of gets on his horse and, and picks and pops and, and wins a decision. You know, I'm, I'm going to agree with you, but disagree with you. I'm going to agree with you that Frankie Edgar is going to win this fight. Absolutely. Right. But I do think that the three consecutive losses does play into his efforts here. I, you know, for if say he were to lose this fight, just playing devil's All advocate, right. four consecutive right. fights where <laughs> you're not on the winning side, it doesn't matter how it happened. It doesn't, doesn't matter who did it. It's just the fact that you have four consecutive red spots on your record. And that doesn't look good at all, no, no matter who no, you are. Sense. I mean, uh, you know, there have been fighters that have lost – Four in a row, and 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 Dana White's like, oh, I'll never, I'll never get rid of him. Right. Or Garcia, for example. But the next thing you know, he loses another fight. He's gone. He's fighting in legacy fighting championships or or something like that. The same can go for Frankie Edgar. Nobody, nobody is bulletproof in the UFC. I'm sorry to say, Frankie Edgar, as tough as he is, if he loses this fight, it's it's he's on the hot seat. I got to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah. It- if he loses this fight, and I, I wrote about this last week on Sportsnet, if he loses this fight, there's not a lot of options left because right. he's gone from title fight to solid prospect, good, good tough kid, but someone he should beat. If he happens to lose, where do you go with him? Yeah, A move down to bantamweight just looks really shady. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's in the same position there where he's got to get a win right away. Yep. It just... 
a victory would really make moving forward a lot easier. I think regardless of, of everything that's come before this fight, Frankie just goes in there and, and has a good, strong performance, similar to the one we saw against Ben Henderson, both times, because both those fights were pretty close. Even a performance like the one he had against Jose Aldo gets him a victory, and so I think it should be a pretty handy decision. It will be very interesting to see what happens if it isn't. Speaking of interesting, the main event is drawing a lot of interest from fight fans, media, and other fighters, in fact. Anderson Silva versus Chris Weidman. A lot of people are starting to pick Chris Weidman to upset the UFC middleweight champion. I am not on that boat. I am not on that train of thought. I think Anderson is going to win this one. You don't win 16 consecutive fights in the octagon right. without having a little bit of skill in your back pocket. Yeah. Anderson Silva has decimated nearly everybody he's fought, even the ones where he didn't have outstanding or visibly appealing fights like <laughs> Talis Latis and, and Damian Maya. Right. He still won them thoroughly. And t- for Weidman, a guy who, don't get me wrong, is a bright prospect, is a very talented fighter, I don't think he has enough experience or even enough skill to top Anderson Silva. ESK, what do you think? I think Chris Weidman could pull the upset. I think he has the So you're picking Weidman. Set. Let me finish. I'm I think he has checking. the skill set. I think he has all the talent in the world. I still look at him as the heir apparent at 185 pounds. I just can't pick against Anderson Silva. No. I would not be surprised if Chris Weidman won. Um, but as you said, 16 consecutive victories in the octagon – some of them being the most devastating finishes and and performances I've seen as a fan and and I remember some iconic moments. And so as much as I like Chris Weidman as a fighter, as a prospect, and really like his potential chances in this, I think it makes sense that he's that it's the the closest line betting line since the Dan Henderson fight. I think Weidman profiles well yes. as an opponent against Anderson. But how do you pick against Anderson Silva? You I mean, just you don't. about it off the top. You know, John Jones is that one dude that I would feel comfortable picking, picking against Anderson. And that's a guy that could fight at heavyweight without <laughs> right. looking fat. Right. So and it so- takes that. Yeah, it takes that, essentially. I would not be surprised. I think Weidman has the skills. I think he follows a similar blueprint to Chael Sonnen. Um, I think he's more devastating on the ground and, and more dominant on the ground, both with striking and with his submission game. But it's Anderson Silva. And, and Anderson sort of gets the, until someone beats him, I won't pick against him. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think that does it, my man. Second show of the day in the books. Second show of the day. Well, I mean, it's the second recording of the day. It's the only show of the week. It's the only show that anybody's going to see. But trust me when I say it's the second show of the day. You'll never be able to let this go with me, will you? I'll probably bring it up next week. Uh, I'll probably ask you if everything's ready to go. I'll make sure. See, next week can be when we get our tech guy slash producer slash resident funny man ivan on the show yes to make sure to give us Absolutely. the thumbs up that we're ready to go we but might we after, might feature him on the show that, next week yeah, definitely after that i'll let it slide well i appreciate it so long that. as nothing happens next week. you know if next week's show is really good i'm gonna rub it right back in your face awesome i hope it is i look forward to it <laughs> and with that i am your host eric fontanez for e spencer kite Thanks for tuning in to the Choke MMA Show. Peace.